road ahead for all of us, I'm sure. Yes, um, uh, but, but I hope most of it will happen um, without violence. <laughs> I hope the protesters you saw were not armed. No, it's like you know, Central New York is, is a is a loud mouthy sometimes, but generally mm -hmm. peaceful place. So um, okay, pe people people disagree here violently, mm -hmm. but not with fists or other things. So it's okay, fine. as long as it's verbal, then everything's cool. <laughs> right. <clears throat> nice back Good on morning. picture, Andreas. Good yeah, morning. Yeah, I'm I'm adjusting <laughs> to, to the. Content. I can't get mine to work. Last time it told me I did not have enough power. Let me see if I can try this hey, out. Hey, we are live on YouTube. Um, I see that. Nice. Yes, but I couldn't verify if the cloud recording works. Um, I have no idea. Okay. Okay, you want a seat? Um, not really. But what I could do is because I was uh, going to join it anyway, I could make a local copy anyway, or at least press the button and see what happens. Um, an hour is about 300 megabytes in the end. So it's not a lot. I think uh, temporarily you need some more storage, but I think I have a few gigab one. Oh. I have only 290 gigabytes free, but that should be enough. Okay. Only he Firstly, said. I have to go. I, I wish you lots of fun in this session and hope that the setup works. Okay, thanks. Later, thanks, bye. Jan. Much appreciated. See you later. Thanks. So. The meeting is being recorded. Excellent. Yes, nice. that's me, at least. Very good, Gerhard. Hey, Marianne, good to see you. So, Maria, in case you haven't um, you haven't had the pleasure yet, these are our friends um, Gerhard and Andreas from our technical sponsor TNG, who are um, who are who are here here for general good sportsmanship and also to re reduce our anxiety about things. Oh. And I suppose well, because no, they're it's interested. It's an important you. topic. The conference is really important for the world, I think, and therefore I, it's I a pleasure doing it. <laughs> But well, we're happy to have you for for more than one reason. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to stay right now, but I was just uh, jumping in to check on uh, on the on the setup and if everything works, but it looks good. And therefore, um, you can start and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Marian. Hi. There we go. Zoom. Not everyone has set a picture on the Slack workspace. All the name differs. Ah, people are joining. Morning, Ramin. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Hey, now we see you. <laughs> Hello, good morning. How are you? Can you see me and hear me properly? Yes. Or, yes. Excellent. That's good. That's good. There are no disturbing noises in the background now from my side? Nope. Oh, that's fine. That's good. That's good. 
I think there was uh, Mr. Bernius. Coffee. No, aren't you here? Doesn't seem to be the case. I do have some background uh, low noise sound from Ramin, at least a little bit. It's not, it's not really an issue. It's just to inform you that there is something, but it's not. Okay, thank not you for the information. So unfortunately, I think my micro normally is working well, but um, well, I will mute myself whenever somebody else is talking. So I will not be disturbing the others in this case, hopefully. Um, if Zoom sees that someone else is talking, uh, Zoom is doing it anyway. So don't bother. All right. Are there any hints on how many people do you expect in the workshop? Yes, I think there were around um, 20. Okay. So some missing. Some are missing, yes. But honestly, we have a very tight schedule. So I think we couldn't be <laughs> waiting too long, yes. Uh, the how many people will be in each session is not exa it's not an exact science um, because every session is is free and open to every participant. Um, but you're right, about 20, 22 people or so signed up for the session. So we'll 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 see how many turn out. And um, I say, whenever you guys are ready, feel free to take it away. And uh, I'm I'm excited. All right. I just in this case, I would propose that we are starting. Right, so good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the workshop for Automotive Software Systems Engineering Education. My name is Ramin Tabakoli, and uh, together with uh, Katja Auerhammer and Matthias Berger, all of us are coming from Nuremberg Tech, um, we will guide you through this morning today. Um, yes, I have to admit that in regard to this uh, specific workshop, there are some first times that come together um, at my place. So this is uh, the first workshop that I have organized and um, it is even the first uh, online workshop that I'm participating at all. And finally, it is uh, also the first workshop uh, with a very dedicated interaction focus and, um, and not a small conference because this is normally the way of workshops that I know. So whenever so many first times come together, um, they are accompanied by risks. And I would like to thank you already now uh, for your understanding and patience whenever such a risk should occur. But I think we have some experience with online meetings by now. And I think this will probably reduce some of the possible risks in general. Anyway. So let's have a look into the agenda for today. Um, we will have two presentations starting at uh, a quarter past 10, the first one, and uh, then a quarter to 11 for the second one. I would like to, the presenters to, to keep the schedule of 20 minutes for the presentation, such that we have 10 minutes left for the discussions. And after the presentation slot, we will have a very short break. So please schedule your break uh, five minutes break for the time after the presentations, because then the second part of the workshop will start, where we will have um, um, some brainstorming and some thinking and discussions around a vision of uh, future automotive software engineering education. And we would like to, to root this vision in expectations and requirements that, um, yes, that have some, um, Yes, but take especially into consideration the industry and the industrial side about automotive software engineering. Uh, but we would like to map this with very concrete course formats or um, specific um, innovative lecture ideas, best practices in lecturing at all. And um, so, so we have uh, developed some ideas here how to make this connection between 
expectations and requirements uh, at the one hand side uh, and the connection to some innovative formats in, in lectures and in uh, education in general. And um, we will have a first uh, round of discussion, half an hour from 11.30 to 12, into parallel rooms. And then we will come together at 12 again in, in this main Zoom meeting and have a presentation of the preliminary results of the discussions from these two groups. And I hope these two groups, they will be formed um, at random. So, so there are no concrete um, requirements or constraints from my side, how these groups should be formed, um, unless uh, it is not possible to find uh, an applicable split up of this group here. Right, so we have the presentation uh, of preliminary results at 12 o'clock, and then we will go um, for another 20 minutes in parallel discussions, where we will very concretely map um, requirements to course formats in one group, and then try the other way around, mapping course formats to requirements in the other group. For these parallel discussions, or these parallel group um, uh, discussions, there will be more information later after the presentation slot. So we will have more information about how we expect these uh, discussions to, to occur, such that in the end, um, for the last uh, 25 minutes, we will have a roundup in uh, the complete group and try to yes, develop this kind of a vision of uh, mapping requirements on automotive software engineers and a specific uh, or a set of specific approaches to um, design automotive software engineering courses. So this is the general idea of the agenda. Um, we decided not to go for the general idea of this conference to have this inverted uh, conference approach. So we will have the presentations in this group, in this Zoom meeting and um, be in contact with the, uh, with, with the authors, have the discussion right, right away in uh, the respective um, presentations. But as you see from the titles of the presentations, they fit very well into the, the later discussion and the later part of the uh, workshop where we would like to develop this kind of a vision. And then probably we can uh, make use of uh, the ideas and um, yeah, the ideas presented in uh, yeah, the papers uh, that we will start with right now. So this is the idea of the agenda. Are there any questions concerning the morning today? No. Okay. Right. In this case, if there are no questions, I would really like to start right away with the first presentation. Norbert English, René Bergelt and Wolfram Harz, an educational platform for automotive software development and test. I would like yeah, to hand over the stage to you and I'm very interested to listen to your talk. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, perfect. So. I will try to share my screen. So, so you should see now the slides, I think. Yeah. Yes, we can. We can see. Perfect. That. Okay. So, um, so thank you for the nice introduction. Um, like already announced, I would like to uh, give the presentation about uh, our approach in education, a platform for automotive software development and test. And uh, like you might know, we in the in Chemnitz, in the Chemnitz University of Technology, we have for already 11 years um, uh, different master and bachelor courses about automotive software engineering. And uh, for already these 11 years, I'm uh, partly responsible for the practicals and some of the um, research topics in this area. So. Um, we want to give, um, of course, students a lot of knowledge from this uh, special area. That's why we uh, want to present our approach because we have many students. We have around about 60, 70 students per semester, which are uh, matriculated to one of these uh, courses. So this means uh, many students and we have to give them a lot of knowledge, many different uh, 
skills like uh, Mr. Rising will present maybe in the next presentation. Um, so uh, when we look to the current situation in automotive software engineering, um, you, I think you will know that uh, we have a special uh, kind of development, which is not so new for computer science, but at least for automotive science, it was uh, uh, partly new from the year 2004 on uh, because they in, uh, companies have, have introduced a system architecture called AutoSAR, Automotive Open System Architecture. And with that, um, the development of functionality uh, can be uh, happen independent from the target platform. So this means uh, we can configure as independent functionality for a special or for specific hardware platform and um, this is uh, quite, of course, a good approach and uh, not new to computer science. But what happened in industry and in the tool environment is that many, many different companies have introduced tools for especially AutoSAR and test um, uh, test uh, areas, in, in especially in AutoSAR. So this means we have many, many tools on the market with advantages, disadvantages, and um, of course, it's not part of the university to teach um, the tools to the students. But however, we have to bring somehow the knowledge how to handle these tools, how what are the approaches, what are the concepts, how to test, and how to develop in automotive software engineering. So uh, TEST has introduced uh, new challenges uh, in the area of AutoSAR development, because now we have different layers three layers, basic software, RT, and AutoSAR. And um, these layers, um, you, you might know that uh, normally you buy the basic software and you develop the functionality. And another layer is generated. So uh, it's really a challenge to localize uh, mistakes or errors uh, from your functionality inside of the AutoSAR architecture. But however, it's, it's really costly to find, of course, the uh, problems later uh, in the worst case on a test drive or with the client who bought such a car. So this means still uh, we have to find uh, errors as soon as possible in the functionality. So our goal was to support students in master and bachelor courses in the area of automotive software engineering uh, in development and test. And when you look to our, uh, I think, well-known V model, um, then uh, we, you can see in the orange rectangle which uh, process or which area we want to support. So this means we want to support the test, the first uh, dynamic test and uh, the integration test in the V-model. Um, our approach should be, of course, easy to use for students. Yeah? We have uh, students with different knowledge levels. So it should be, uh, all students should be able to use our tool set. And of course, we want to support the development and the test of easy use itself. It doesn't matter if there is a student or an employee or researcher. And uh, we have uh, close contacts to industry. So this means uh, we do not want to develop a tool just for a university or a tool environment. We want to uh, be close to uh, the industry approach. Yeah. So uh, what we did uh, is we uh, created an uh, overview of the development process for uh, the learner, so in our case, uh, the student. And uh, when you look to our development process, we start at the left side where you can see the AutoSAR development. Uh, this is the point where the student normally starts. This means he has a task or a functionality description, and the student will develop its, its AutoSAR application, yeah, which is C code uh, with special interfaces, yeah, predefined interfaces. And um, the student has uh, to bring this code, this functionality to a, to a hardware platform, an ECU, electronic control unit. So this means he has the a role of a normal developer. And of course, after this development, he has to test his functionality. And like I said before, especially in AutoSAR, this is a challenge because the student or the learner will have to check um, all the layers, the basic software, which is somehow operating system and its services. And of course, the student can do this with static tests. So this means where the test object is not executed and dynamic tests where um, the test object is executed. And um, of course, in, especially in AutoSAR, the question of the test object is um, 
even a challenge because you have many dependencies. So this means um, what is the test object is the question for the student. Yeah? Is it the application? Is it application and uh, middleware means RTE? Uh, is it basic software as well? So um, different questions for a student. When the test uh, is uh, done, uh, successfully done, then uh, the learner will uh, go to the integration tests and test drive. So we have in our department uh, research cars and demonstrator cars, small copy cars, which, uh, with, uh, which have some, some real easy use on it. Um, so this means he can, uh, the student can check its uh, functionality and implemented things directly inside of a car. So um, during this test drive, we, want, we support, uh, of course, uh, recording test drives and recording um, bus messages and uh, OBD messages and so on. And uh, after recording this, the learner has another role. So this means he has to analyze uh, the recorded data of the test drive. Yeah? And uh, when this, the learner will see a mistake there or problem, then the, uh, the development process starts again. So the learner has to go again to the outer side development, has to fix uh, errors and so on. So um, you can see already here at least three roles which we uh, focused out uh, will um, be important for the learner. And this is quite a lot. Yeah? So especially when you look to master courses, which are two years long, um, this is not so much time for the student uh, to get into the topics. So we have um, especially developed two systems, which you can find in the rounded rectangles. Uh, on the top of our development process, it's uh, called ASTAS. It's a demonstrator for testing AutoSAR uh, systems. And on the right side, you can see the TOC Drive Cloud. Uh, at integration tests, it's a um, database for recording test drives. So uh, I will go on more into detail about these two uh, tools. When we look into ASTAS, um, some um, maybe have heard it about. It's a uh, demonstrator which uh, was developed uh, in the last five years. And um, this demonstrator, uh, like, like I said, it's, it's basically for AutoSAR systems. And it contains uh, static tests and dynamic tests for AutoSAR easy use and projects. And the special uh, feature is that it's um, AutoSAR compliant. So this means um, uh, we follow the guidelines of AutoSAR for testing AutoSAR systems. And you can use it with different tool chains and in different AutoSAR versions, I have to add for the classic platform currently. Um, a special fact is that we have uh, generated a special database. We call it knowledge base, AutoSAR knowledge base, uh, which contains the architectural knowledge inside. Yeah? So you can see all the modules of the basic software, RTE aspects inside of this database. And our test tool um, accesses this data for generating automatically test cases. Um, so as another special feature is that we that our static uh, tests can um, can uh, suggest some correction for the learner. So for example, if an application uh, if there are some ports, some connected ports are missing, or the task mapping from application task to operating system task is missing, or if the wrong data types are used. So you can see in the picture on this slide um, the AutoSAR tool chain. So um, is integrated into our workflow. We have an AutoSAR project, uh, which we can um, load inside on our tool environment. And based on the, on the um, wish of the uh, student, of the learner, the learner can add some static analysis, uh, some tests, and of course, can add some dynamic tests. Yeah? So uh, and these are executed automatically. And it concludes in, in a test analysis report at the end, which is stored into a report database. And the special thing is that this, this um, test analysis report in ASTAS is AutoSAR specific. So it means it uh, refers to the test objects um, of the knowledge base. Yeah? So you can see where mistakes happened and which test object is, um, is involved in, into this problem. When we uh, look to 
the current uh, graphical user interface of us, as you can see, um, green and white rectangles. So in, in the first row, you can see static analysis rectangles. So each rectangle represents a module, and each module has a, a special task to do. So for example, in this case, we have um, a scheme validation. Yeah, so is our Autosop project uh, valid and well-formed? And does it fit to the official Autosop specification? We can check runnables, functions if they are empty, and we can check if ports are correctly connected. And uh, after the static analysis, um, in the second row, you can find the dynamic test. So for example, the check of the basic software can stack and the RTE check. So um, the dynamic test is executed on the target platform. And you can imagine that the student can access our server and can load and can add to his test process these prepared um, static and dynamic tests. So it depends on his skills, which, he, which the student uh, chooses. So at the end, uh, the learner will receive an, an report about problems inside of the Autosop project or uh, performance problems inside of the basic software. And uh, when these reports are successful, um, of course, he, the student will make a, a test drive. This means we have an, a hardware device. Currently, it's a res Raspberry Pi. Um, which this learner can add to his uh, demonstrator or to our research car. And so we can record the data, um, for example, on OBD2 or directly to, uh, to the bus. So when the learner ha uh, has developed his own research car, so of course he can take the data directly from the communication system. And um, we even have integrated the camera picture uh, so that uh, the learner can um, uh, take a video from his test drive. And uh, special another feature is that we are able to um, add virtual test drives, means virtual car uh, from Carla, the drive simulator, into our database. So even especially in our times, if the research cars, uh, if you cannot use it, um, then you are able to, to do a virtual test drive. So you can see in the picture that we have an API for recording. Uh, to fill test drives into our database, and we have an API for analysis. And this is accessed by the web interface and different tools. So when we look to the current uh, graphic user interface or web page of our Took Drive Cloud, then you can see, uh, for example, uh, one test drive, which we have taken with our real research car. And um, of course, the test drive is based, is mapped to a card based on the GPS coordinates. Um, we can um, show the video streams if available, of course. And of course, uh, we, we map the timings to the current time, which is shown uh, of the test drive, because you have an, uh, another frequency, which is um, grabbed from the, you have different uh, frequency from the video and from the sensor data. So you have to map it somehow, and of course, Having these test drives inside of a database enables um, yeah, a playground uh, for machine learning. And our students, are, they know this password and they just want to do machine learning yeah, <laughs> with these test drives. So it's an enabler for our students um, to play with the data. Yeah? But I can tell you it's not so easy. So um, of course, you need some, some real application for doing this, yeah? some, some real use case. However, this is not our uh, main research area. We uh, concentrate on test of uh, automotive systems. And uh, our main goal was to give some mapping between these two uh, reports from our uh, Autostar testing tool and our um, recording database. So the goal was that the student has somehow an idea when the student has two reports, that he has somehow an idea what happened. Yeah? So, uh, and especially when you did changes in the functionality or in the architecture, uh, then you, and of course, if Astas detects it, uh, then you will be able to highlight uh, messages inside of the test drive data. So this means, uh, for example, IO data uh, can be mapped to sensor data, and of course, communication data can be mapped to bus messages. So what we did is um, that, 
changes in architecture and problems are highlighted before the test drive starts. So we can tell already the learner, um, please be careful, there, there's a change. So um, record this data. And after the test drive has happened, we are able to highlight it yeah, in the monitoring tool so uh, that the student can see that there is a change and that there might be a problem. So at the end, we want to have um, some conclusion about both reports. Yeah? Otherwise, the student then has to uh, search for it on its own, and this is quite uh, costly. So to give you an example, um, I want to show you a picture from our um, famous yellow cars. So we have um, developed them yeah, eight years ago. These are small demonstrators, uh, bobby cars, where a child up to two or three years can sit in. And we have uh, put a set of ECUs to these yellow cars, and they have different functionality, um, like light control, remote control, and some um, automatic uh, uh, yeah, driving, <laughs> um, avoid obstacles, and so on. Uh, but we are really proud for our light control. So we have um, installed uh, different light positions, up to six, six, 16 light positions in the yellow car, underground light, interior light, uh, puddle light, and so on. Uh, like we know it from computer game Need for Speed, for example. And this development was um, done completely AutoSAR uh, compliant. Even the test process was done AutoSAR compliant. And when we give a task to a student, for example, uh, that the student has to uh, integrate in a live counter or the, the, uh, checking a live counter in an AutoSAR application, then the student will add a software component into the application layer of an AutoSAR ECU on the yellow car. And maybe the student forgets to connect it um, correctly into, in the application layer. So what will happen? The basic software will be configured correctly. The RTE will be um, hopefully uh, generated correctly, but the port is uh, not correctly connected. Um, this means the student can compile, the student can flash, and the student will do a test drive. Yeah? Um, what happens in our case, our AutoSAR, AutoSAR test tool uh, will see this open port. And uh, normally, in the current version, it will suggest you a correction. Yeah? It means uh, connect this port, and it will look if there is an open connection and if it's possible to connect it automatically. But if this uh, is not available for the student, um, then we will highlight it for the test drive, yeah? this new signal and uh, change in the architecture. So this means after the test drive has happened, um, the student will see the highlighted signal, the change, and might see uh, uh, the change in the test drive data and the signal if there is a connection to this uh, check of the live counter. Sorry, just a short remark. Two minutes yeah. left for the presentation. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, to give you an, an idea how our toolchain looks like, so we have the uh, AutoSAR toolchain for three versions, 2.1, 3.2, and 4.0. Um, we have the Electro Betresel Studio and AutoCore, uh, and from these spaces, system desk and warehouse, which the students can access. And, and for our automation, test automation, we use the ECU test from the company Tracetronic um, to develop the yellow cross application. We have all the three. AutoSAR versions inside of our knowledge base and in the content of the Tuk Drive Cloud, our recording for data drives, uh, we have nine configured cars with 62 sensors. Uh, so this three drive setups and currently 145 recorded test drives. This is not so much, uh, but looking back, uh, especially for this year, I think it's, it's quite okay. Yeah? We would like to do more, but it wasn't possible until now. Um, to give you an idea about uh, learning and teaching AutoSAR, um, what we did with this knowledge base, uh, we added an e-learning or le learning management system to our knowledge base. I told you that the whole content of the AutoSAR architecture is inside. And when you look to this uh, picture, then you can see our learning uh, system where we can show processes of sending a signal, receiving a signal inside of the AutoSAR basic software with text, animations, video, and uh, a link collection. Um, 
And uh, we added um, another functionality because for students, it's quite a challenge, a huge challenge to learn AutoSAR, yeah, depending on the uh, skills, what they have already when they start learning AutoSAR. So we added even uh, adaptive learning to the system. So this means we can um, differ between five different states or we classify the knowledge with assessments and uh, we give them stepwise more knowledge about AutoSAR, the system architecture, yeah? from the architecture to the basic software modules and to the programmer view. Um, so uh, when I summarize, uh, we have created uh, two tools. Um, the Astas and the Took Drive Cloud, which supports the AutoSAR development and test in combination with test drives. Um, we connected the or we, we connected the reports and uh, to, to gain some, some benefit of it, of two of the AutoSAR testing and of the uh, drive test drives. And uh, what is very important for us, like I said at the beginning, we our approach contains commercial tools yeah, that the students get used to them. And of course, it's usable for our demonstrators. It's uh, usable for our real research car and for virtual test drives, virtual cars. And like I have shown shortly before, um, we have an e-learning tool which uh, yeah, helps the students to learn uh, how to saw in an adaptive, uh, adaptive learning. So um, sorry, I had to hurry up a bit. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so uh, I just want to give you some uh, or three pictures for the impression of our test drive. So we really used our uh, took drive cloud uh, with the real BMW, which we have. And uh, of course, with the yellow cars. And I think it's, it's quite a, a good idea to teach students uh, in this way, the, the three roles, developer, test engineer, and data analyst. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentations under the reactions under reactions uh, slot you find uh, clapping hands so if you uh, okay. want to uh, clap your hands uh, it's possible to do this here obviously but i can't see my clapping hands no nowhere yeah. no i see it <laughs> sorry all right yes thanks so much for the um, presentation very impressive i have to admit uh, that uh, you can run through the AutoSAR development within one course. Did I understand this correctly? This is one course where you also have some um, walk through the complete AutoSAR process um, until uh, the development or until flashing the ECU. Um, yeah, I would like to. It's not a complete AutoSAR process. So uh, we teach them. So it was our first approach yeah, to teach them the whole process, uh, but it was uh, not possible in the regular uh, lecture units and so on. Uh, so we stopped uh, with testing um, the application, but we asked the students to join in practical and seminar and master thesis to, these, uh, to the whole process. Yeah? But of course, uh, um, it's not the task to teach just AutoSAR, the AutoSAR development approach. Yeah? It's not the task of the university. They should be able to, to develop embedded systems and maybe on the example of AutoSAR, yeah. So they, they use the whole AutoSAR tool chain um, in practical or research internship and master thesis. And the, the practical itself or the lecture stops when we, uh, or the, the exercises of the lecture stops after the RTE. Thank you. So, so we have um, six minutes left for um, questions now. Are there any questions from the audience to the presenter? Yes, uh, sorry. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, can you say something regarding the feedback you received from your students? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, it's uh, completely different, the feedback from students. Um, some are really lost. Uh, they don't understand. <laughs> um, they don't understand the approach of AutoSAR. I, I would say um, even they are... Um, they stuck in, in the tool chain of AutoSAR. Um, I thought we have not such a perfect tool chain with uh, the Tresus, but uh, look, after checking some of the other tool chains, I think we have. And um, what we did already, we added some scripts to the AutoSAR tool chain. 
uh, to make it more easy, uh, the, the usability for the tools of the tools. So completely different. We have some uh, experienced AutoSAR developers, or AutoSAR tester, and uh, they like it. Yeah. And some they don't understand. So. And of course, it, it, it's a result in, on the different levels. So we are very international. So we have students from different countries. We have students from uh, mechanical engineering yeah, with computer science uh, topics. So they don't understand this uh, fact. But uh, all the students with computer science background, uh, for them, it's, it's quite OK. And maybe for the connection between to Drive Cloud and Astas, this is mm -hmm. uh, quite new. Yeah. So for the for the connection, the feedback we don't have it at the moment because of uh, COVID nineteen. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any further questions? So um, just just ask my question. And Co Coburg University, we're trying to uh, build up also an Autosar development environment. So we tried with the vector stuff. And we failed. So um, <laughs> because the uh, we needed too much uh, effort to get it to work. Yeah. So what's your ex what's your experience? Um, do you have to have many persons working on this? So the okay because it's just yeah. one one professor is not enough. So I <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Uh, so we had very good employees, or we still have hopefully. <laughs> um, so and student workers uh, which want to go into uh, yeah, which wanted to understand the basic software and so on. So they were highly motivated and um, they did a great job. And um, for example, the AutoSAR testing tool was or is still my PhD. So uh, we have employees which are going really into the details of this uh, topic. And uh, it, it's a huge challenge. And I would say I would not do it again, honestly. Um, we did the change or the switch between AutoSAR 2, 3, and 4, and it was always, I would say, six, seven months of work to do this uh, switch between the outer saw versions. Not because we are stupid, it's more uh, you have bugs, you have uh, migration problems, yeah? Outer saw is really good, but when you switch hardware and the outer saw version, and in the worst case, the tool chain, it just uh, creates, yeah, much work, yeah? And of course, for a university, we cannot produce outer saw ECUs. Um, it's not allowed for us because we are not a member until now. Um, so it's just for research, yeah. So we cannot earn money. So this means it's like you know, <laughs> some side project, yeah. So much work, yeah. I have no better solution, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if I would do it again like this. I don't know. Uh, yeah, we had good employees. I would say this is the the key. Yeah. Thank you. But just to, to take up the, uh, Ralph's question again. Um, a vector. Uh, did you make any experiences with Vector? Because we had the same uh, situation as obviously Ralph's group had, because um, a Vector was not working with us. But, and we have the same uh, setup as you described. It was Studio plus uh, um, System Desk from DSpace. And this is working fine for us. I was thinking, because we have a very close connection to Electrobit, because they are just uh, the neighbor city Erlangen from here. Yeah. So I, they supported us very, yeah. very, very much. Uh, we didn't receive any kind of similar uh, support from Vector, but do you have any experiences in this specific regard? Uh, we, we we are uh, really close in contact with Electrobit too, so we had no no uh, reason to change. Um, and we had contact with Vector because they have these tech days where they go to the different cities, and it was too expensive. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I can say the number, but it was like. Uh, small car yeah for each year even for universities uh, so uh, i told them we cannot uh, pay for it yeah and we have so many students uh, using these pcs so we would need at least 10 pcs with the autosol tool chain so uh, looking back to the years uh, the price is now better but um, yeah even now it's too expensive yeah and like you said we have very good expensive with, with electrobit and they are close or very good connected to the hardware uh, companies like STM and Freescale, so it was quite okay for us. Thanks so much. So there's probably um, time for a very short last question.
If there's no question from the audience, I would like to pose uh, this uh, short question. What about the connection between Kala and Autosan? I didn't get this. And we were looking into both, but um, they, we can't see any specific possibility to connect um, the Kala uh, simulation environment with Autosan. What is your experience? Uh, no, there, uh, so there is no connection. The Kala is more and uh, it was the first try to bring test drives into the to drive cloud. So there's no connection between uh, Kala and Autosan. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Even for the discussion. Thank you again. And yes, I would like to hand over now to the next speaker. And the title is, or better said, the, uh, the authors. Um, Ralf Reising and Yvonne Sedelmeier towards competence profile for automotive software engineering. We are looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Ralf, if you are talking right now, we can't hear you. Yes, uh, so I have a problem with uh, deactivating, the microphone, deactivating the microphone. So good morning, everybody. Thank you, Ramin. Thanks. So uh, this presentation is from Yvonne Zedelmeier and me. Unfortunately, Yvonne is not able to join us today. She's the expert on didactics of software engineering. So I have to emulate her a little bit. Myself, I'm a professor for automotive software engineering at Coburg University, which is located in the north of Bavaria in Upper Franconia. So you might know if you have a car, insurance in Germany, you might know the Huck Coburg, which is a big insurance company. And you might know the logo with the, with the, with the, um, with the castle on it, which is the most famous thing about Coburg, just 40,000 inhabitants. So if you don't know it yet, don't worry. <laughs> and we have a, a large um, project, which is called Evelyn which is short for Experimental Improvement of uh, Software Engineering Education. And it's, unfortunately, it's ending by the end of the week of the year. And so we try to get, create some results. And there are five universities are part of the project, and two of those have something related to automotive. So it's two professors working on automotive software engineering there. And that's why we also focus on automotive software engineering. So in this talk, uh, always the same with Zoom, stealing focus. So in this presentation, I would first like to give you an idea what, what the problem is, the challenge in teaching automotive software engineering, especially in the question of what to teach in automotive software engineering. So we have also have to talk about competencies uh, in automotive software engineering. And in the end, I'll give a short summary and outlook how to proceed from the, the, improve, the, the suggestions we make. So first of all, um, I'm now teaching automotive software engineering for 10 years now at university. And it still seems that there's no clear picture among both academics and industry what should be taught in automotive software engineering. And especially also if automotive software engineering is a single course inside a curriculum like automotive mechatronics or um, mechanical engineering, or is it a full curriculum like we heard from Norbert, Norbert English, English, sorry, uh, English in his talk where they have a master automotive software engineering. What is the better approach? What, what are the different um, competence profiles for those? Two applications, single course, and full curriculum. And the last question is also, what exactly is a competence in automotive software engineering? So what we think about is what we need in the first place is like something like a competence profile, which tells us this is what you have to teach in an automotive software engineering course or in an automotive software engineering curriculum. And so the first thing we did, we, we asked people. Um, we asked people. So the first um, number of persons we asked were from the industry. 
So in 2018, we did a workshop with uh, tier one suppliers from, from the local industry. And you can, as you can see, we did a lot of cards, and had them put down what they think should be part of an automotive software engineering course or a curriculum. And they came up with things like, well, they need to know about machine learning. They need to know about Autosol, like we've heard in the last presentation. They have to know about Agile, Scrum. They have to know C and C++. And they have to know tools like Canoe and MATLAB Simulink. And they have to be team players and they have to be able to self-organize themselves. OK. <laughs> so what do I do now? Um, let's ask the academics. Maybe they know better. So in 2020, this year, before the lockdown, there was the automotive software engineering workshop from the G um, so, and, uh, Computer Science Society, the Gesellschaft Informatik Special Interest Group in Innsbruck, in, in the context of the SE 2020. And there was also a discussion at the end: What do we should we teach in automotive software engineering? And it came out that still what it's unclear what automotive software engineering is and what the scope of automotive software engineering is. Is it a single course? Is it a whole curriculum? Um, and in the end came up that the, the, the picture is the same as industry. Nobody knows exactly. So my observation and um, from others was maybe the problem is the scope. Um, and it's because automotive software engineering has a lot of connections to other domains, like for example, engineering, uh, electronics and so on, mechanical engineering, and also dependencies on other fields of expertise, like for example, computer science, software engineering. So maybe there's, there's an issue with getting structure inside this. I jumped across the, the competences. So let's go back to the competences in general. So Yvonne Sedemeyer, which is unfortunately not able to join today, she did a PhD on competences on software engineering in general. And she observed that there are three different kinds of competences in software engineering. So first of all, you have something like soft skills, which are generic, that is domain independent, for example, to be able to give a presentation. This is both applies to social sciences as well as engineering sciences. It's not dependent on the domain. But on the other hand, there are domain specific um, soft skills, like for example, communicating about a software architecture. That you use specific um, tools, you use specific uh, diagrams and specific terms. And that's why you have a domain specific competence to be able to communicate such things as software architecture. And if you think about competences, the first things that come to your mind, that's why I put it last here, is factual knowledge, facts. And of course, not only facts, but also methods. For example, how to create a UML diagram, which, which describes the state automaton, state machine. So these are mainly domain specific, but not there. Of course, there are some general things also, for example, um, how to write something which other people can understand. You might say this is a soft skill, but on the other hand, you have things like um, spelling, for example. This is also factual knowledge. Okay, so now we have the idea of automotive software engineering being linked to a lot of other domains, and we have these different levels of competences. And now let's come to the idea that we have to give some, to bring some order to the chaos at least the case I perceived at these workshops. And the idea is as follows. We have um, automotive software engineering here. Some of the part of software engineering. And you could say that uh, the automotive specific part of software engineering is here in this part of the model. And it's kind of embedded inside the systems engineering, of course, system engineering contains software engineering. This itself is contained inside the engineering domain. And this is itself in, contained inside the context, which is kind of general stuff, which is needed. 
and we did a parti partition between automotive specific stuff, like for example, aut automotive software engineering in this part and software engineering in general in this part. And um, some reviewers said that of course, the general also contains automotive specific parts. So let's put this more, more specific. This is kind of general without automotive specific. <laughs> so this is kind of everything but automotive specific. For example, we have some things which are not automotive specific in the software engineering. For example, the software architecture ideas themselves. And of course, then there are some applications of software architecture inside the automotive domain, maybe using SysML instead of UML. Okay, so we have kind of layers as um, you might know Shrek. People said ogres have layers. And of course, you can also say um, that's kind of the onion. So we have kind of an onion for automotive software engineering. And of course, if you want to teach something in the software engineering domain, you might need some knowledge from the systems engineering domain, which in itself might need some knowledge from the engineering domain and so on. So it's kind of the interdependencies can be made clearer in this kind of order. So let's look at some examples, what I think or what we think should be placed in the different parts of the model. So let's start with the context. And I also always do this partition for the general, not automotive specific stuff, and the automotive specific stuff. So for example, being able to write a document, ethics, law, mobility, society, things like that as a part of the context, which are not really automotive specific. And then of course we have some regulations, law, for example, on, on vehicles, roads, road infrastructures, lane markings, traffic signs, parking instructions, and so on, parking infrastructure and so on, which kind of create the context for the whole automotive domain. Moving on to the next layer, engineering. There we have a lot, um, so I was unable to put everything on the slide, but I hope you can read it. Like for example, mechatronics made up of computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, physics, material sciences, project management, open loop, closed loop control, simulation, combustion engines, of course also electrical engines, um, sensors, actuators, product safety, and so on, and so on, and so on. And of course, in the automotive specific domain, we have things like hybrid powertrains, automotive sensors and actuators, which are mainly sensors from the general domain adapted to the automotive domain. We have specific regulations, for example, from the SAE. We have specific um, standards, for example, for quality management, which are adapted in this, um, instance from 9000, 9001. Moving on to the next layer, systems engineering. Here we have, um, for example, general stuff like the V model we also seen in the presentation before. Agile development, requirements engineering, system architecture, system testing, cybersecurity, functional safety, and so on and so on. For example, UML, SysML. These are not just for software, this is for systems engineering. We have some better systems, real-time systems in the loop testing, which is not specific to the automotive domain. Think, for example, for um, air traffic. And of course, also for um, trains. So if we look at the automotive domain, we have things like automotive spies, which tells us how to develop, how to document, we have functional safety, like for example, ISO 26262. We have uh, safety of intended functionality. We have cybersecurity for the automotive domain, which is still in the draft status. We have bus, special bus systems for the automotive domain, vehicle to X communication, diagnostics with the standards, and things like uh, modeling with the East ADL, for example, which is based on UML, uh, SysML. So moving to the inner layer, to the software engineering. We have things like programming, for example. We've seen that before with, when you're asking the industry, C, C++, testing, model-based software development, continuous integration, machine learning, as we've seen before, 
these come up here. And of course, for the automotive domain, we have special things like Autosaw, we learned in the previous presentation. Um, also, an operating systems used inside Autosaw, um, programming standards like Micro C, and of course, the software specific part of the functional safety, which is inside part six of the ISO 26262. So, in my first understanding, we can place everything which cut, might come up inside automotive software engineering curriculum or course inside this model. And help, this helps us to understand if it's really part of the core of automotive software engineering or if it's part of an outer layer. And of course, the question is, do we have to teach everything which is part of every layer in automotive software engineering or can we build on other courses, for example? So we distribute these um, things which I talked about, which of course are not competences, I should add. These are more fields of expertise. And from those, we have to derive, derive our competences. For example, do people have to know about Autosar, that it exists, that there's a classic platform, or do they really be, have to be able to create an Autosar software to program it, to test it? That's, of course, part of the question of the competences, the level of competences. So how to use this? Collect your competences and distribute them inside the model or maybe first start with the fields of expertise. And then you can start to think which of these do you really need inside your course or inside your curriculum, and which of course, which might come from different sources, for example, from previous education. For example, if you have a master, you can require some things from the previous bachelor. And of course, you have to think about the dependencies. You can't teach. Um, East ADL without people really being being knowing what software architecture or system architecture is, or possibly they also should have some knowledge about UML and SysML first. And so you need some things from the outer layers to be able to teach something from the inner layers. And second, um, of course, you can think about putting some of the stuff inside non-ASE courses. For example, at the Coburg University, have, we have an automotive mechatronics um, bachelor, and we have just one single course on automotive software engineering. And we have also some computer science. Um, so we teach programming inside the computer science part of this, the program. And then we do everything but programming inside the uh, automotive software engineering. So, what we have in this um, proposal, we have this reference model, which we, as we, we know is just a starting point, but I think it's really useful for the discussion. As I said before, my impression was the discussion of what is really part of automotive software engineering or what should be part of automotive software engineering is a kind of a chaos. And I want to bring some, some order to the chaos to give some structure to the discussion. And I hope we can use this structure today in the discussion too. And as you said before, these are the different parts of the competences, factual knowledge, generic soft skills, and context sensitive soft skills. They can also be placed in the model. And especially the generic soft skills are probably more to the outer layers. And the context sensitive soft skills will be distributed above the across, sorry, across the whole model like the, the factual knowledge. So the next steps would be after we get a deeper understanding of the, the competences we really need for automotive software engineering to then um, really do some research on what is really needed, how should it be structured, how, how does curriculum look like. And then of course, um, as I showed previously, the, the content, as we focused on in the first place, the content also has to be matched by didactics. And of course, then we need some teaching methods, we need teaching materials, like um, Norbert told us about the tool chain, for example. And of course, settings, like for example, having the students really work with those tool chains and getting those to the, to the cars so they can really understand 
what, uh, what, is, what we want to teach them and that they have the competencies in the end. So this is the end of my presentation so far. Now it's time for your questions. Thanks so much for the presentation, for the very interesting um, presentation and the um, nice categorization. I think it will help us later. So we can make use once again of the clapping hands, exactly. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Okay, so let me start uh, with a question probably. Um, <clears throat> so, so you made this uh, competence profile as a basis for getting structure into this uh, discussion about what uh, should be taught in automotive software engineering. Um, do you have any practical experiences with this? So um, did you reflect this information, for example, in a specific automotive software engineering course to the students? To, was this helpful even for the students? Was it uh, helpful for the um, uh, for, the, for the, the pragmatics of the course, or was it only uh, relevant for you as a lecturer in the context of such a course? Okay, um, so this idea, as, a, as I said, is, is quite new. Um, and as the lockdown came in March, we had to start uh, online teaching right away. <laughs> so there was no time for thinking about content, there was just time about uh, creating videos, <laughs> unfortunately. So um, I was not able to apply this yet. Um, something I didn't tell in the presentation, which is inside the paper, there's also um, a curriculum for certification of automotive software testers. And um, yesterday, I was, as I was creating a presentation, inside this curriculum, there are already competencies in terms of learning objectives. And I thought about uh, this morning how to place these learning objectives inside the system. And it should uh, become evident that in this uh, curriculum, this, most of the things should be placed in the automotive specific part because it builds on a generic testing um, certification but it will be mostly inside the software engineering and the systems engineering, not in the engineering and the context. And this is because it builds on something which is already there. And it leaves out most of the details on non-software stuff. But as Norbert said, you can't teach software engineering without something you, have to, you can touch. And for having something to touch, you need engineering. <laughs> So I think uh, automotive software engineering really has to also have some part of engineering inside for the application part. So to make the answer short, uh, I haven't applied this in practice in the <laughs> so far, so sorry. It's fine, thanks so much, Hal. Are there any uh, questions, further questions or remarks? Okay, so let me add another one. Um, East ADL, you mentioned East ADL, and I think you placed it in systems engineering, which I can understand. But um, what is the, uh, the border between systems engineering and software engineering? Because um, um, I mean, would you, or let me try to interpret it myself and then probably uh, you, you can better correct it then. So uh, systems engineering is uh, everything which is above the implementation layer. And whenever we have some um, approaches which also uh, tackle the implementation layer, then you would place it into software engineering. Is this the border between these two um, layers? Um, for me, systems engineering is um, mostly mechatronics, that is mechanical stuff, um, electronic stuff, electrical stuff, and software, everything. But you think about it on, on the, 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 the layer, the, the level above, so as a, as a whole system. If we take, for example, the ISO 26262, it has um, a part four, which talks about system. 
Uh, part five talks about hardware and part six talks about software. So this is more the, the level of everything but software. <laughs> um, but of course, system engineering also contains software engineering, but of course the, uh, the green stuff is everything but software engineering. But of course, system engineering as a whole also contains software engineering. That's my understanding. And uh, what about fitting in a layered architecture like AutoZar? Because AutoZar also um, talks about a system layer. It has this um, modeling layer above the virtual functional bus. Uh, so this is also more or less system yes. layer. Would you place it? Yeah. Yes. So so automotive uh, AutoZar also has uh, system engineering aspects. So you can. Like as you said, the virtual functional bus is not not a software specific thing. It's it's a concept from the systems engineering. Um, so it's debatable to, to place it into the software engineering part, or, also, or you could also put it here um, as a as a concept to develop systems, not just software from one ECU. That's correct. Um, I decided to put it in the software engineering part because there are some things of Autosar which are applicable or single to the software domain, for example, programming um, guidelines, things like that. But you're correct, AutoZar could also be placed here in the system engineering level. Okay, yeah, that's interesting because uh, for, for me, I understand that there's some, um, some because in, in software engineering in general, most of the approaches are layered. If you think about, um, or, or at least there are other possibilities to, to introduce some hierarchical layers. And, um, and this is also reflected in languages like UML or SysML, for example. And um, although they are not defining concrete layers of abstraction, um, they more or less enforce or uh, desire that uh, they should be applied in, in a layer, layer thinking. So, so there are some connections even with your layers, but um, um, it is sometimes probably debatable where to put uh, the specific approach um, itself. I, I think that's interesting, yes. Okay. And I think this, um, this uh, systems engineering layer approach is very helpful later for the discussion, I could imagine. Um, at least for some kind getting an idea about categorization uh, ideas that come up here and probably even having a feeling about where we we think that we have a more or less um, complete or good overview about um, possible things uh, that have to be taught in soft, automotive software engineering and uh, other aspects uh, which seem to be very uh, avoid, um, not very well uh, elaborated yet. This was just a remark. Anyway, <laughs> no question. Yeah. Yes. Okay, but we have, uh, in fact, uh, two more minutes left for the discussion. So if there are any questions or any other remarks, uh, they're welcome. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. Ralph, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I've a more general question you, you mentioned it, it, it is somehow difficult to find out what are the expected competencies by industry even by academia i don't know um, what how, how did you how did you approach or how did you try to find out what does the industry need as competencies well um we tried just to ask them so we so we did a workshop on automotive software engineering with these tier one suppliers from from the local industry and um, we asked them what do you do you think you need both in the in the three areas basically that is factual knowledge uh, in the soft skills both general and uh, context specific and we asked them to, to write down uh, the cards and we collected those cards, crit typical brainstorming. And then we did made a discussion about what is missing, what is what should be removed. And then we asked them to vote on the, on the three most important. So we gave them three uh, red dots to, to put them on the cards and came out 
basically the things that I showed you on the slide, very, very different things on very different levels of abstraction. And basically it was not competencies, but fields of expertise. And for the, for the academia, I just followed the discussions, sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, this brings me to, yeah, I have, I, I, I have not the slightest clue how, how to tackle that. Uh, frankly speaking, I, we, we tried that for software engineering. It was a, a master thesis. And to keep a long story short, it is somehow difficult to at least to, to talk about competencies with parties who are, mm, let's say, not very well trained to describe competencies, not even to write down competencies. And for, for me, it's still a question how to, how to overcome this, um, let's say, shortfall. Um, because as academia does not know what, what kind of competencies are needed, or what kind of competencies are higher ranked than others. Um, it is, I mean, just digging somewhere or just defining something which is later on and it takes a long time to find out later on is not needed or wrong expect expectations and, and so on and so forth. So how, isn't it a more general problem than defining another, let's say you, you try to make an, a, a, a layered approach for automotive software engineering. But the, the more general question for me is how to, how to talk to each other about competencies. Yeah. So I suppose you have to work with examples. So for example, if you represent this to the industry, we would have to place many, many examples inside the model of, of competencies and then maybe then they can understand what is really the question. Like, are you talking about examples um, like scenarios taken from industrial cases or are you talking about examples of teaching? Uh, of, of things we, we could teach, for example, in the area of, of, of systems engineering. And so that maybe that's, it's easier to choose than to come up with own, own ideas or to, to generalize from specific examples. Maybe this could work. Okay, thank you so much for the discussion. Thanks so much for the presentation. We can clap our hands once again. Right. Thank um, you very much. Thanks so much, yes. Um, for the two presentation, uh, or presenters, um, would it be possible for you to, to post your presentations as a PDF file, for example, in Slack, in our Slack uh, um, workshop room? I mean, if you're willing to, I mean, this is not uh, mandatory, of course, but I think uh, the audience could be uh, interested to look into the slides again and check um, one or other fact later. Um, yeah, so probably even for the discussion. Right. You can also post them on the conference website if you want to, up to you. So, so you can probably just put a, a short remark if it's okay for you if this is also published on the conference website. Otherwise, uh, we would keep it in Slack. I mean, it's published anyway. So, and, and when, once it is in Slack, I would uh, assume. But, but it's up, up to you. So uh, you can decide whatever you want. Right. So this was just uh, a short organizational question. And then I think um, our little um, head start uh, 
is now um, consumed completely. So we are back on uh, the agenda track. So we have five minutes now, more or less. Five minutes for a short break. Uh, so grab the coffee and just um, come fresh again. Yes, that's good. And uh, we see again in five minutes, which means 20 past 11, back in this room. Thank you so much and see you in five minutes. See ya.
Okay, so welcome back everybody after our short break. Let's have a look once again into the agenda. So we um, had two very interesting presentations. Thanks once again for them. And now we would like to start the interactive part of the workshop. So we mentioned already that uh, we will be uh, talking about um, some kind of a vision. Um, so on the one hand side, what are the expectation and requirements uh, on the automotive software engineers? This is more or less the industrial viewpoint. And the other uh, idea is that we are also talking about software engineering courses, um, which means course formats, innovative uh, ideas, best practices in um, lectures and um, software engineering or automotive software engineering education in general. So for these uh, group discussions, first of all, there's a link to the documents and this link is also posted on Slack. So uh, you see here, the link is available on Slack. If you hit this, link you should end up in um in this google drive uh, folder and um and here we see these two uh, excel sheets in google drive for group a and group b so whoever experiences any kind of problems uh, getting access to the google drive just uh, tell tell us um, it should be possible to access these uh, documents without um, without um, uh, any Google um, uh, sign in or so. It uh, should be open to everybody. Right. And um, so for the first round, we are only looking into these Excel sheets. They are depicted here once again. So these two Excel sheets, group A and group B. And um, so for group A, what shall be done? We should be discussing experiences. Uh, or better to say we are not discussing them in the first place. We are just collecting them. So what are your specific experiences? And um, these experiences, we also wanted to cluster in the specific um, situations. So for example, and um, if you open this Excel sheet, for example, then we see we have several different uh, categories here. So experiences that um, are drawn from OEM. Either um, you have been working um, at an OEM or you are an OEM and make some experiences in the industrial practice and would like to derive some requirements on the automotive software engineer from these experiences. So there was something um, very well done or something, um, a scenario that was very uh, successful. And then you can derive requirements or expectations on the automotive software engineer. And you can um, collect these experiences either in the category of the OEM. This doesn't mean that you have to be yourself an OEM, but it should be from the perspective of an OEM, or you have been um, experiencing this once you are working at an OEM, either being really employed at the OEM or as a consultant or whatsoever. And the same is true for the supplier. So even here, we would like to uh, collect experiences from the supplier's point of view, probably from the consultant's point of view, there are specific experiences that you made or even um, providing or offering courses for industry. I'm not talking about academic courses at universities here only courses from the industrial or for the industry. Or even you have um, read about interesting experiences in the respective literature and um, can share it here and probably derive requirements from them. And for all these uh, aspects, we also have the possibility to pose questions. Probably you can't come up with a concrete requirement based on a specific experience, but you pose a question that you would like to discuss later. So this is the format for uh, the group A and for group B, we have a slightly different format because we are looking into um, teaching best practices or teaching innovations or specific teaching, teaching formats. And um, here we would like to connect experiences that you made in teaching 
with some best practices, some ideas uh, that you would like to share or that you could imagine could be um, successful, or you even have uh, questions in this case. And uh, this is um, possible to be clustered within the academic courses or industrial co courses. Industrial courses means um, that you are providing or offering a specific course for the industry. This may be also of interest. Right. So this is the um, the idea. And um, for the group A, the targets, um, you should think about your own experiences from which you can derive requirements or specific uh, questions, probably, that has to be discussed. Um, on the automotive software engineer, you can group these requirements within experiences. And you don't have to group these requirements to your own experiences only. But if there's an experience written down, uh, in uh, this Excel sheet and you have an, a similar experience, then you can just add your requirements to this specific experience. And experiences can be described as stories, or short stories, we, we have to keep it short, or uh, short statements. And then you can define your requirements for the automotive software engineers. And the requirements should be atomic. Uh, this shouldn't be necessary to be mentioned in the context of software engineering experts. So here's, a, here's an example of how it could look like. So for the experiences, um, overview of the auto the standard is missing due to its uh, complexity and size. This is something that you experience probably as an, a tier one supplier. And then you derive some requirements. This is just an example such um, that you have an idea how this could be written down. Any automotive software engineer must know about auto modeling language. Any automotive software engineer must be able to model and configure an auto system on system level in an appropriate tool, and any automotive software engineer must be able to read and understand any given AutoZap basic software configuration in an appropriate tool, once again. So this is something that um, we could come up with. Um, so this is an example how um, experiences could be described or requirements could be described. And Similar for the group B, where we are talking about experiences and putting them into context of teaching best practices and innovations. So we should think about our own teaching experiences in which specific teaching best practices or teaching innovations or special teaching formats were successful or even unsuccessful. This could also be of interest, of course. And it is not mentioned here, but probably this is also of interest for, for, for us. And then we should group um, our best practices or our teaching um, experiences, um, teaching um, innovations within these experiences once again. So we have an experience and several um, course design best practices or innovations can be derived from this very specific experience. And experiences can be stories, uh, once again, or specific situations, so specific teaching situations or specific teaching context that you would like to, um, to consider. And then we would like to define or explain the teaching best practice here. So for example, just as an example such that you know in which direction we could think, uh, the ECU implementation in the context of an online course. So we would like to implement ECUs, which are automotive specific, um, obviously, and um, uh, we are in the context of an online course, so we do not have real access to the ECUs. So what could be derived from this experience? This is more or less a context description here. And um, then you could say we need to set up uh, re remote access to the laboratory computers with connected ECUs. So students can access the computers remotely and uh, connect them over this uh, computer to the re um, respectively connected ECUs and then have a video stream of the ECU per computer to show the ECU reactions, uh, probably an LED state um, or an LED blinking whatsoever. So this is more or less the reaction of the ECU, such that the student um, at home or wherever um, knows about the reactions of the ECU. And uh, a local staff member is obviously necessary in the laboratory in order to solve any um, problems occurring during the ECU implementation phase. So, so, so this could be some kind of a, a situation and some best practices and course um, ideas that uh, could be applied here. 
So this is what uh, group B targets um, cover. And we would like to, in this first round, to, to be along this schedule. So we have five minutes brainstorming. So each of us is starting to fill out our own experiences and requirements in the respective um, uh, Excel sheet here. So we are working at the same time in the same document, which should be working fine. And then we have a short discussion after these four, first five minutes, we will have a short discussion of these tables within each group, such that we understand what the others were thinking, what uh, we were thinking and so on. And then we will have another uh, brainstorming within each group um, to, um, yeah, to comment probably on questions or on requirements from others or um, put additional experiences and requirements or best practices into the, the, to the table. And then finally, the last 10 minutes should be a clustering and sorting within each group. So this is the timetable for our group work. And now I would like to have more or less half the group staying in this Zoom meeting. And then we need to set up, uh, or we have already set up a second uh, Zoom room where uh, the, uh, the other half, um, so group B, should be gathered and be talking about the second job. Um, and we could use the breakout room feature that we have here. You yes. Want. Could you just um, explain uh, the breakout room? Um... Sure. I have. Um, so I'm a co-host of this meeting, and what I can do real quick is uh, I create two breakout rooms, yes. and uh, at, at the click of a button, um, you will all, against your will, be moved into one of the two rooms at random, okay. and um, then there's at the end of the yes. time it for a certain period. That's fine. Um, but we can then afterwards come back to this room. Yes, yes. And clicking leave breakout room and then you'll yeah. wind up in this one again. That's great. And I think it's even possible to uh, flip the rooms yourself because that was a recent update in Zoom. So probably yeah. that is working as well. Yeah. Okay. But, but for this uh, first uh, group, we, we will be staying in half an hour from now on in our own breakout room. And if you're um, doing this in a moment, uh, just giving everybody the possibility to pose questions now. In principle, is everything understood? Yes or no? It would be great, of course, if um, I could be in one room and um, Katja Auenhammer and Matthias Berger would be in the other room, because then we have at least two moderators who know about the principal uh, guideline. But um, yeah, we'll see if, um, how we end up. If there are no questions concerning the jobs that have to be done, uh, I would propose that we just split up in these randomly uh, organized um, breakout rooms. Okay, so um, I have a question. Uh, sorry, I didn't really got it. Um, so for for the other room, we switch to uh, the random room in uh, Slack, or um, I'm not not quite sure. Sorry. No, no, not in Slack. We are not. Uh, we are breaking out uh, this group in Zoom into two groups now. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. We are breaking up uh, this group into two breakout rooms, and then we will have these parallel discussions: Group A and Group B. And it doesn't matter if um, somebody from Group A is uh, from academia and somebody in Group B is from uh, in industry. It doesn't matter. It, uh, okay. It is uh, okay if we have different perspectives, different viewpoints, but we are discussing in Group A. Uh, experiences and expectations from the industrial perspective and okay. putting it into the context of experiences. And in group B, we are discussing, um, you know, um, you know, academic uh, experiences and put it into the context of innovative um, um, formats in lectures and um, okay. teaching in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Bastian, is it possible? for us to go into these breakout rooms now. Well, let's try. Thank you so much. So see you once again in half an hour. So the rooms are open. People are getting moved over. 
and I'm probably staying here because um, I, I don't think I'm really helpful. I'm not really from automotive. Yeah. Even if we have uh, customers there. But my experience there is zero. And people should be able to switch. Yeah. Sieht so aus, als wären jetzt uh, Marian, du und ich in den, als die einzigen Co-Hosts in, in diesem Raum hier verblieben. I'm not sure if this is in, oh, it's probably streams back to, still to uh, YouTube. So if you're joining us from YouTube, hi there. Um, <laughs> Gerhard, Marian and I are, are the co-hosts of this meeting and we've remained in this room while everyone else is going to breakout rooms. Um, two breakout rooms are going on right now. One with Andreas, Bernd, Patricia, Ralf and Tim Rethbridge, the other one with Gerhard Müller, who didn't join <laughs> because he's still here, Jörg, Katja, Matthias, Norbert, and Robin. That so seems um, this seems okay. to work just fine. I was hoping that uh, I would at least stay back so that in case someone joins the um, the workshop session now, they're like, where is everyone? <laughs> so we can like <laughs> force them into one of the rooms, which is, uh, or invite them. But if people know how to use breakout sessions and Zoom, they should be able to do that themselves. Yeah. But I'm not sure if everyone is really so familiar fami familiar with uh, Zoom breakout rooms. Yeah, surprisingly, there was a bunch of people who, um, um, during the test sessions on Thursday, who had some lingering uncertainty, or I wanna, don't want to say anxiety because they were not anxious people, but... Um, lingering uncertainty on, on how this works. Uh, so uh, good I that you prepared these sessions then. So yeah. it was just yeah. the right thing to do. Yeah, it was your yeah. suggestion if I remember correctly, Gerhard. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, you did it. So it was, well, it was a very good idea, and um, I'm really glad we did it. I mean, it was it was unsurprising. Everyone joined and goes, "Oh, oh, oh, this is easy. Oh, I'm so glad." So um, <laughs> it's I, I think <laughs> it was unnecessary from a technological perspective, and it was very, very necessary from a psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. At least the one um, test session that I did, and it was fun. We also had an opportunity to chat with a bunch of people I don't usually get to chat with. And it was really, really just nice. Yeah. Cool. Alle Moderatoren im gleichen Good. Then I will just monitor this room, but I will just, um, uh, for the uh, recording, will just uh, play, uh, stop my video. Let's go. Hey, look at that. Tim is here. We're having a hard time in one of the breakout rooms. We don't have any moderator. Yes. We have like five people. So Katja I just, uh, we, I just moved Katja over. Okay, so I'm going to go back to that breakout room again. Hopefully, it'll put, put me back to the same one. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I can hold on. I can, I can do it against your will. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Can I do this? Oh, do you want to go back to the same one, or you want to go to the other one? Same one. Same one. Oh. I told them I just go and come back. Like, you know, okay. put in wait. Oh, cheapers. Why can't I? I All right, hold, hold on. Hold on to your hat. It's got, it's happening. I hope he's now in the, in the correct room. Oh no, you're back. <laughs> Did that not work? You're still muted. Hold up. The the first thing it said was that it, we will connect you to the meeting. It went the screen went white and then it waited for oh. 20 seconds and then it came back here. So let oh, me try okay. to join breakout room myself. Okay. See what happens. Yeah, breakout room one, it says. Das ist ja alles spannend. <lacht> Scheint funktioniert zu haben, oder? Äh, jetzt wenn das selber tun kann, ist das das Beste, was passieren kann. Ja. So, dann werde ich auch mal kurz noch in ein anderes Meeting reingehen.
Vorteil, aber da bin ich noch nicht ganz fertig wegen Pricing. Ich habe überlegt, wenn die Konkurrenz kenne ich Multi-Road. So.
Hello, how's it going? Dennis? Uh, hello, I'm just hello. checking. I'm, hello, I'm just checking. I'm from other uh, workshops. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. How is it going? Okay. No, uh, it's it's okay. Right now, I once again, I'm just visiting. I'm just checking that my Zoom is working with conference. And... Yes, it is working just fine. We're we're happy okay. that you're here. Okay, I'm here. You. Okay. There's some breakout rooms going on for the current workshop. Would you like me to assign you to one? Uh, not right now. I have my classes uh, at my university schedule online right now. So I, I'm just checking that my Zoom is working. So. Okay, I understand. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
just like that, against your will, you're all back. Actually, it did give us a little bit of time. It said, you can now, or a minute from now, you'll be against your will. Oh, <laughs> that's convenient. Well, you know, we're, we're doing very, uh, we're trying our, our darnest here not to force people to do anything they don't want to do, right? It's, uh, consent is good in every aspect of the life. According to YouTube, by the way, we have eight people currently watching the, the, the stream. Hi there. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you weren't bored for the last 30 minutes when you had to look at us being in workup groups. Yes, okay. So thanks, uh, everybody. Um, I hope uh, everybody is back from the workout groups. At least my group is back here again. Katya? Was it possible for the, the other group to, to discuss? Okay, that's good. I see. Uh, this. Fine. Yes, my idea would be that we shortly just uh, um, wrap up and um, talk about um, the results that we have found out. So what are your um, preliminary uh, discussion results? So I would uh, propose that group A which was uh, which was the group uh, in room one uh, is starting who would like to present your discussion ideas yeah i said that i would do that um and i'm going to post the uh the, the, the google spreadsheet a link i think it's you've already got it in the chat um so you can click on that if you want to see it see it um so we came up with a list of about nine top level experiences and i'll just quickly rip through them so the first one was that was knowledge of IT security, including uh, uh, security protocols, data privacy regulations, and uh, security in relation to real time problems. Um, the second one was knowledge of auto SAR, including general familiarity, um, classic versus adaptive, and concepts like virtual function bus and cogeneration from auto SAR. The third was uh, complex interacting state machines, including uh, working with systems that have multiple interacting state spaces, um, working with complex events like error events, timeouts, repeated tries, um, and cogeneration from state machines. Then there was a user interface design and evaluation, um, including um, uh, interfaces and ergonomics for systems that involve specialized hardware and evaluating um, the experiences users have, including error rate, understandability, learning and memorability of, of end user systems involving hardware. And we, we were talking about the fact that uh, even if we have completely fully self-driving cars, there's still gonna be a user interface because people have to tell the car where to go and set the climate and all the other kinds of things. Um, the next one was knowledge of safety assurance cases. So this is fundamental in both the automotive and aerospace industries. Um, basically it's, a, it's a, a case expressed in some kind of logic um, that is designed to demonstrate that a feature or a system uh, is safe according to a set of criteria. Um, and this is used for certification of such systems. Um, people need to have an understanding of both how to create and uh, design against, uh, design a system to meet the assurance cases. Um, the next one is broad knowledge of automotive feature sets. So what's out there already, we don't want people to be designing systems that work in different ways, uh, unless, unless there's a good argument for that. Um, and um, they also need to understand what's being proposed for the future, not just what's in existing vehicles. Um, then we said that there, would be, there should be uh, knowledge of development models in general, which are not necessarily in competition. So the V model is widely used in automotive and agile methods are widely used throughout software engineering and they're not necessarily in conflict, although sometimes perceived as such. And, and then of course, UML, so Autosar is a profile of UML, but UML in general has many aspects of it, including timing models that would be useful. 
Um, second to or third to last, we have software testing in general, specifically um, test case generation based on formal methods um, and uh, code coverage, uh, especially with regard to various standards that exist out there as needed for automotive. Um, then there was uh, Python knowledge because uh, this is the dominant language used for training machine learning. So we want we need uh, people to understand Python, but also to be able to uh, train deep neural networks and work with uh, TensorFlow um, and and, um, and and test also such neural networks so that you can design automotive systems with them. And finally, um, embedded programming. You know, getting deep down close to the hardware, programming close to it, bit operations, registers, callbacks, and um, working with real-time operating systems. Right. Thank you so much for the uh, collection. So I see that you have um, you have already named categories for um, yeah for areas of expertise, if I understand this correctly, and. Uh, that's yeah. um, of course helpful. This um, clusters um, these requirements at least uh, to some extent already, mm -hmm. and it's also very diverse. Uh, so you have a very diverse set uh, of topics collected here. And uh, um, I was even wondering. Um, I can understand that uh, AI systems plays a crucial role, but in AI is only in very small parts uh, uh, really uh, part of the automotive industry so um, sometimes uh, it is also very important and I think you made the discussion here when you were talking about the connections between D model and agile methods uh, the same is more or less true for AI systems and adaptive autos for example there, there is obviously some connection but it is not very, very elaborated and it's not very uh, well known how this uh, connection looks like and most of us didn't um, see an uh, adaptive autos system running ai code i assume mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay um, the, the python thing is from my side this is just something i got from a supplier mm -hmm. we talked to and he said well you, your students here they don't know anything about python they have to be they have to be able to program python okay thanks I mean, in this case, it would be really very interesting to know from this person, what is the context? What, what uh, was the, the basis for argumentation? Was it just a general idea or was it the vision for the future? The next um, generation of automotive software engineers should be able to, um, to program in Python or um, is it something that is really urgent today? Well, the supplier is working on um, laser scanners and these have to be able to, they get a, a, a cloud of dots and they have to create from these dots by AI methods, they have to create objects. And that's something they work on at the moment. So they need this now. And that's interesting, of course. That's of, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Right, Group B. Uh, we didn't uh, talk about a moderator. Who would like to present um, the things that we've discussed in Group B? Norbert or Jörg, anyone volunteering? Okay, so let me um, try to summarize it from my perspective. So um, experience, um, one experience that we made in the context of teaching these topics is that automotive software engineering is mainly, uh, or teaching automotive software engineering is mainly possible uh, on master's level only because of the manifoldness of these topics. And we have seen the uh, manifoldness that, that you collected in Group A. And, um, and we think, um, so as a teaching best practice or some experience here, the Automotive Software Engineering course picks uh, um, or looks into different areas and, and ideally quite deep into a very specific topic, but within a very limited time frame in order to be able to cover various different topics. And um, yes, one best practice, at least, uh, that um, we discussed was that um, each unit should be accompanied by, um, by working in a concrete tool. So it would be more accessible for the students if they are really working in a specific tool rather than modeling um, with a pencil on paper, for example. So, so there's another kind, at least, of um, 
a connection to this specific topic, although we also discussed the problem um, because many tools are, uh, yeah, a problem in its own, on its own, and therefore um, students are only um, disturbed by uh, the tool uh, sometimes and looking into the problems that the tool had. Let me step into the DAWs uh, discussion in this case. So students mainly complain about the tool itself rather than the uh, understanding the underlying methods and techniques. So whenever we are applying a specific tool, we have to take into consideration that this may occur, that um, the students try to optimize their tool um, applicability or their tool knowledge um, rather than understanding what, uh, what they really should do and how the, uh, in, in the case of DOS, how the requirements should be formulated, for example, or how the requirements could be reviewed properly. So this is only um, possible to, um, to mitigate this risk um, by um, being in close discussion with the students and having some um, break points when the work and the tool is, um, is stopped and we are looking uh, and reflecting what we have done uh, within the tool rather than um, discussing which click would be better. Um, yes, and then here are some best practices from automotive software engineering in the AutoZap context quite specifically. So the lecture should be done in combination with practical units. So this is once again a topic-based approach, bus communication, AutoZap test in specific topics and uh, with hands on um, uh, practical units. An e-learning system is um, an idea um, to teach um, programming skills in detail, interfaces, parameters, and um, concrete architecture. And the problem um, is that some students um, don't have the appropriate knowledge to follow um, a course on, Automo uh, on AutoZap, for example. So if there's no uh, information or no knowledge at all on embedded um, systems or embedded uh, programming, then it's possibly useless to start with uh, AutoZap, because this is some, something like a prerequisite, which is also connected here that at least um, in, in my context, the master level is more or less this prerequisite. So the idea is here that we have some kind of um, a first assessment uh, uh, grading and whoever really is able to, to answer uh, the respective questions properly um, can access the course. And demonstrators are very usable and useful here with real applications such that the students really have the experience from requirements to test meaning that um, there's much more um, possibility for the students to experience in this academic context than in real industry later, because in real industry, you will never cover the complete systems development approach. But from the student's point of view, this could be very fruitful. Once again, um, even if you're looking into the engineering perspective, uh, according to Ralph's um, um, layered uh, model, um, so if you're not looking only into the automotive specifics, then still the project hands-on uh, examples are very uh, useful. So having them parallel to the lecture, the project simulation um, with defined uh, roles um, of the specific actors um, is necessary. And once again, an e-learning course is uh, described here. The problem with hands-on um, examples or group work in lectures is that it's possible to grade the students uh, appropriately because um, they have to receive their marks independently for um, the specific work and not just for the group work wow. and then the other thing is in the context of um, industrial courses um, i was myself participating for example in a vector course and we had five days um, stepping through the complete vector tool chain and um, click by click and there was a i don't know one thousand pages manual uh, that uh, gave us an overview about the specific uh, clicks we have to do. And this is boring and not very elusive, at least from the technical point of view, but somehow it is also necessary. So um, as a best practice um, idea for the course, it is we need some of these manuals, we need this click by click um, uh, information, but still uh, we would like to offer the students the possibility for a second run through the system in, in another, with another task, for example, such that they can um, derive um, their, their approaches on their own without being um, 
yes, um, tied to this click by click um, manual, um, which was probably necessary to, to make a first run. And the other problem is that these click by click manuals are often outdated. Um, I mean, whenever this document is printed and uh, handed over to the students, this came may be outdated already. And therefore, a wiki page like Confluence would be probably more useful than um, the manual itself. So these are some of our findings. Are there questions or remarks? OK, so if there are no further remarks, then um, we would like to start a second round of parallel discussions. Um, and we have prepared, I hope this is finished, we have prepared um, these uh, diagrams here. And if you open these um, diagrams in the folder, then we have our current collection of requirements from group A and the best practices from the lectures from group B. They are put together in the best draw AO document. And um, now in the breakout sessions, we would like to connect them with one another. So which um, best practice from lecture, probably you would like to add some of them, should be um, supported or should be supporting um, some experiences for the um, automotive software engineers or for, for the future automotive software engine, engineers and the requirements that they should um, should offer. So it takes quite a while for me to open it now. Um, Matthias, do you have an idea why it takes such a long time? Um, no, it's working fine for me. Yeah, so in principle, it, it looks like this. So we have these um, uh, the ex, um, experiences, some of the requirements. This is what um, Group A has um, developed. And then we have the teaching best practices. And we should um, connect them with one another. So which requirement could be best achieved by which best practice? Probably we need to, to announce these best practices as well. So probably due to the very limited uh, time frame. We didn't come up with uh, with all of them, even those that we have already um, gathered experiences with. But still, um, this is the topic for the last 20 minutes. So if Bastian could uh, send us back into the rooms again. So room one um, is looking into the uh, group. A draw IO and room two is looking into the group B draw IO. And you should make the connections between these um, best practices from lectures and the experiences and requirements from, um, from group A from the first round. Bastian, is it possible once again for 20 minutes breakout sessions? Great, you're ready. Um, Bastian, uh, Katja, and I need to share the same room for this. Yeah, please can oh. you make sure we are in the same room and it's not the room that ramen is in ramen is in the other room <laughs> okay well uh, I'll, I'll click on random and then i and then i nudge you how about that yeah that's yeah that, that sounds Hold fantastic up. thank you 20 minutes much. starting now thanks so much see you Bastian, if you need anything from me, just tell me. Okay, um, thanks. Just uh, be around the corner. It's just why Slack probably is the best. Okay, I will. I, th I think we're doing just fine, um, but thanks. Yeah. Good. See you later. See you in a bit.
Right, hello everybody. I hope you're back from the breakout sessions. Yes. Also, honestly, from Group A, we had some tool problems with this draw I.O. I hope you had uh, better experiences. It didn't really work out for us so properly, so we um, so we didn't reach very far. Um, probably it would be uh, if you had um, if you have some um, results, it would be probably better if you could start Group B for the presentation of your results. And then probably we would just add in um, some discussing uh, because, as I said, we had some problems here. You could start. Okay. So I uh, no one volunteered to present our results. So I think I would just uh, <laughs> barge in. And uh, Matthias, could you please share your screen again? Ah, okay. Perfect. Uh, all right. So we also had a little bit of trouble with the draw I/O. Uh, such that the arrows didn't want to go where they should belong to. <laughs> so I will please please ask <laughs> Matthias to help me out if I get anything wrong here. Okay, okay. So we had to map the uh, teaching best practices to the uh, requirements, and um, yeah, I, I just go from top to bottom. I think uh, would be best. So the automotive software engineering only part, I think that's mostly uh, simply software engineering that's AutoSAR, um, uh, that would fulfill the AutoSAR requirements. Um, next one would be best practices from automotive software uh, engineering, I suppose. Uh, for example, lecture in combination with practical units, we thought this would be perfect uh, for real-time problems. So we had this, this first presentation with a yellow car. I think that would fit perfectly here. That was a pretty good example for that. Um, then uh, the best, uh, then you had the e-learning system. And this was actually something that we thought would fit to a lot of use cases uh, or requirements, especially those that were theoretical. Because those should be uh, very good to convey in a, on an e-learning platform. Next one, uh, yeah, then there's another e-learning one. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so the e-learning for teaching programming skills would be perfect to teach Python, and the other one for generic competences would be perfect for any other theoretical thing. Sorry, <laughs> my mistake, so yeah. Uh, and then we had the doors which is the requirement engineering so, uh, software from IBM. Um, and that would be perfect for, uh, where does this arrow go to? Uh, Matthias, can you help me out, please? For Azure yeah. methods. I, th I think we had this to Azure methods, right? Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I, did I skip one? Uh, I, I remember we also had like an error from project simulation uh, with defined roles. And this one, sh uh, I think, should also belong to uh, Agile methods. And uh, user experience design, if we have one role that's a user or so they can probably help out here. I, I forgot this error, sorry. No problem. I think it's this one, this short one here. <laughs> if you just keep it uh, open like this, probably because um, for, uh, what we were discussing, we were discussing um, connecting the left hand side to the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And um, so one thing that we were missing on the right hand side uh, was um, the idea of the motivational uh, lecture, such that uh, we have an, a possibility for the students to step into this area, um, have an overview about the things that um, are necessary in general because of this wide uh, uh, manifoldness of the topics that have to be recovered in automotive software engineering. And the other one was that um, 
some simple tool support is needed first. Um, I mean, we had made the experience with this uh, tool that this was uh, somehow problematic for us, um, getting, um, get, getting it up and running and then getting the errors to the correct places. So, um, so this was a very clear example for us that um, for at least some aspects, it would be good to have a very simple uh, tool support. So for example, there was one thing mentioned on the left-hand side, which is uh, working with systems that have multiple interacting state spaces. At least in this context, we have discussed it. Yes, yeah, upwards. Um, yeah, one more. Yeah, this is the one. And um, so, so this was one example where we made the discussion that um, some simple uh, tool support is necessary, such that we are not really starting from the beginning with complex doors, with complex um, Trezos uh, Studio or any other Autosar um, tool, but um, have a more um, simple approach um, into uh, the correct uh, way of thinking in this context of automotive software engineering. At least this is what I understood from this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, I teach some, you know, some of these concepts in Ample. Can't do everything that 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 full order SAR tools can do, but it it's so much simpler. Students can ha get get you know get their hands on and play around with all kinds of scenarios and really understand the complexities of state machines really well, without having to get their their hands dirty with a whole slew of other stuff. Right. Yeah. So these were the things that we have discussed um, somehow, but uh, unfortunately we didn't uh, come very far because of our tool problems. I'm sorry once again for the group that uh, we had to cope with them. Yes, but in general, um, I think, um, what was the idea of this vision? The idea, I mean, this vision is definitely not complete, but at least it is some starting point of a discussion taking some requirements that are probably uh, the perspective of the industry and putting it into context for specific teaching uh, formats and teaching practices. And I think um, it is complex uh, because drawing these arrows, I'm, I mean, it ends up um, that somehow very many different teaching formats and approaches are connected to, to very different uh, requirements. And um, even the other way around. I mean, this was uh, expectable. This is not something that um, is very um, um, unexpected here. But um, I think in, if you are looking into literature, literature is always uh, very much interested to have an overview about what is the concrete result of a specific teaching approach. What is the concrete result of a teaching approach, and how it will really end up into the uh, requirements that we would like to impose on. Uh, in, in this case, they are students, for example, such that they are fit for the industrial challenges. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not so certain if this, um, this is something that we um, can, can really clearly state what uh, the concrete outcome is for a specific um, innovative teaching practice. What is your idea about this in general? Um, so looking into the perspectives that were described right now here, do you have any idea what this is um, possible to derive for the target um, that teaching has, which is fulfilling some requirements. And I think the requirements in the case of automotive software engineering are very definitely the perspective of industry, isn't it? Or is this the wrong perspective? Um, in my opinion, we should definitely look for the requirements from the industry for the teaching. Um, but uh, the problem is um, to fit the requirements in best practice, as we saw in the discussions. Um, not uh, just um, the requirements often too wide for a limited time frame um, that we can um, um, wrap in a, in a course, uh, but also for the different kind of learners we have in the courses. Um, even if um, some examples are um, best um, teached just theoretically, um, if the particip participants aren't 
uh, fit with just ther uh, theoretically uh, learning styles, but more practical ones. Um, I think we need to also find uh, a bridge uh, to also um, fulfill uh, the requirements for the other participants. Uh, is, is clear what I mean? Yeah, um, it's it's um, my opinion is that we not only need to fit requirements for best practice uh, best practice teaching styles. Uh, from the industry side, but also from the learner side. Um, it would, it's uh, not ideal to just say, okay, this is now the best practice for this requirement without a backup plan for, 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 other, for other learning styles and the participant. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so you, you mean to meet uh, different people's preference of learning? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that was a good point that was made that um, if we just go from the side of industry, we get what industry requires, but we need to close the loop just because industry needs something and we use a certain type of learning. We're not sure how effective this method of learning is with diverse types of students. I think especially with the master's degree programs, we've seen that um, they have very different backgrounds in their bachelor's degrees. And um, what is adequate for one group of students with a bachelor's degree in one area may uh, not cover all of the deficits from other students who come from different universities with a different background. And would this mean that, um, I mean, there was a discussion about um, some some kind of an assessment first. So once you've passed this is um, the first assessment for the course, then um, it would be appropriate for this person to join, otherwise not. Is this uh, the way to tackle it or would it be possible to make an, uh, yes, in, within the course, um, a specific um, handling of uh, some different um, knowledge which was existing beforehand. Is this possible for a course like automotive software engineering, which really requires a lot of knowledge in various areas before the start, more or less? Um, I would say if, um, if a lot of background knowledge is needed, then you then it's impossible to handle it in, in, in a course itself. Then in this cases, you need some sort of assessment. Okay, and in the context of the automotive software engineering, if we take um, the presentation uh, of uh, Ralph once again with this uh, layout uh, um, overview about the, um, um, the different um, areas and um, in, in the heart of it, we have the automotive software engineering. Um, what would be the background knowledge? Is it always the general knowledge, which um, he depicted on the right-hand side? Is this always the prerequisite uh, to follow uh, what um, automotive software engineering covers? Or can we delve into some um, automotive software engineering specifics right from the beginning and say, this is an illustrating example for something which um, which could be of interest um, even for those who are not very specifically interested in automotive software engineering but would like to um, discuss aspects from the general software engineering so from the right hand side of this model it's hard to say i i i I think um, that's this is something need uh, need to be handled by the host of the course, because he knows uh, which which topics um, are worked with, and based on this these topics uh, you need uh, to make a, a special assessment for the background knowledge. Uh, for example, on an autosa course without background knowledge about UML is, is it's just not working. Okay. 
Okay, right. Well, if there's no further feedback or any further comments, um, unfortunately, we are at the end of this workshop. Um, so we were rushing through um, these um, brainstorming sessions, of course, due to the uh, time limit. It was um, nevertheless very inter interesting to see what your experiences have been, what um, requirements you would derive for automotive software engineering courses, and um, how we could connect them to teaching best practices. So this is what we have covered in the last discussion part of the, of the workshop. And even for the two presentations, uh, I would like to thank once again the speakers. Uh, I would like to thank the active um, discussions. I would like to thank for the active discussions in the group and even here in the presentation in the um, complete room. And I would like to wish you a nice uh, remaining conference, um, which will be uh, going on more or less the rest of this week. So I'm looking forward to see you also in the other conference rooms, other workshops. Thank you um, for the organization of the conference. And yeah, this is how I would like to conclude this workshop. Thank, Thank you very much, much, everyone. Just in case you're interested, the Journal of Automotive Software Engineering um, will have a special issue on automotive software engineering education and training. And uh, details are to come in the not too distant future. And I'd like you all to consider um, supplying a paper or two. Until then, thank you much. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.